everybody. Um, really, there's just one more thing I want you to know about me, and that is I value meetings that end on time. So I can assure you this presentation clocks at 55 minutes. We will get you out on time and hopefully with your money's worth. Um, also, um, I failed to really get a room lav mic set up. We got the video recording going like crazy. Um, so I'm going to just be projecting my voice for 55 minutes. If you find that you can't hear me, uh, please raise your hand. Or uh, if you want to move up a little closer, that would be great too. If you don't understand this, you don't understand your profession. Dr. Ann Rogers said that to me years ago in my Intro to Computer Systems class at the University of Chicago. That thought really stuck in my mind because I noticed that it, in our profession, as multifaceted as it is, where there are so many things that you could set yourself to understanding, there really aren't many things that you could honestly make that statement about. What Dr. Rogers was getting at was this. As system abstracted as our programming languages are today, it is inevitable that some point in her career, an engineer will hit difficulties that require at least some understanding of low-level system behavior in order to solve them. I eventually came down on the side of agreeing with Dr. Rogers, and I'm going to assert one more tonight. If you don't understand open source, you don't fully understand your profession. One can spend years in the corporate trenches, as I did, without ever intentionally thinking about open source as a thing. It is so much a part of our ecosystem that though you will certainly encounter it at some level, it's possible to float along and never really break it down for yourself. And unless you spend just a little time learning about the lay of the land, you will hit situations where your lack of understanding will be a detriment. For example, licensing issues. Especially in corporate settings where many projects aggregate open source resources, if you want to hold any type of technical leadership, um, you're going to have some type of accountability for licensing issues, and it's going to encroach on open source territory. Software architecture options is another example. Whether you're in a large corporate setting or working on your own project, it is very useful to know about solution candidates from within the open source ecosystem and how they might fit or not fit into your situation. A fourth example, or excuse me, a third example is your own professional options. Networking, resume enhancing work, options to position yourself for the career that you want. All of these will be tremendously enhanced by an understanding of open source. And last but definitely not least, intellectual satisfaction. It's an extraordinarily interesting topic with many layers of significance. The hope for the first part of today's session is to advance your technical understanding of open source. Then we're going to connect some dots between the two ecosystems of open source and social activism and social leadership. Finally, I'm going to give you a red carpet invitation to get involved yourself. What is open source? Open source is a widely adopted, yet strangely amorphous, system for producing and sharing computer code. It has distinctive history, culture and philosophy, community of practice, approaches to commerce, and a heritage of artifacts, all of which are coalesced around specific technical, legal, and economic constraints. Open source has a distinctive history, culture and philosophy, community of practice, approaches to commerce, and a heritage of artifacts, all of which are coalesced around specific technical, legal, and economic contexts. An open source project is always characterized by unrestricted source code distribution. It is often also characterized by collaborative, voluntary contributions, and self-organizing workflows. History. That's the first stop in our journey today. 
I have organized this historical overview as a set of landmarks that are salient in principle, kind of like a family photo album. But what I mean is that I articulate history as a series, as an unfolding series of essential realizations rather than just a sequence of events. We will talk about people, places, and dates within that context. And as such, not every important thing will be mentioned. Why? Because that's how to extract meaning from history in order to properly situate yourself into the future. And the future we will discuss in a bit. Now to the 1950s, dubbed the Elder Days by Eric Raymond. 1952 landmark. An early example emerges of a major non-hobby software collaboration by profit sector competitors towards shared outcomes. In time, we will come to call this sort of thing a pre-competitive collaboration. In 1952, the IBM 701 was released, the first commercial electronic computer by IBM and the first in the famous 700 series. From a modern perspective, this computer is characterized most starkly by what it did not have. No higher level languages, no compilers, utilities, no keyboard, no monitor, just instruction codes and a very crude console input device. West Coast defense contractors needed to squeeze as much as they could out of this machine, which cost $15,000 a month to lease. So they embarked on a collaboration they called PACT, the Project for the Advancement of Coding Techniques. Excellent acronym, if you ask me. Um, PACT was what they called an automatic coding system. Today, we would commonly call it a compiler. It was developed cooperatively and then shared among employees of several different competing companies. We're interesting to note, there are several primary source materials within the ACM Digital Library. Really fascinating stuff. If you have access to that library, I recommend spending some time reading through there if, you have, if you're so inclined. 1960s and 70s landmark, the hacker culture flourishes. A hacker is a person who delights in having an intimate understanding of the internal workings of a system, computers and computer networks in particular. Hacker culture is those people in community with each other. Anyway, through this time, computing power remained very expensive and centralized. The hacker culture was driven fundamentally by these practicalities and also, I think, by the relatively small size of the culture at that time. Beginning in 1961, MIT folks did a lot with Digital Equipment Corporation's PDP series. The PDP-1 is pictured. Fabulous picture, it's like Star Trek or something. I just love that. Um, a terrific example of the hacker culture finding roots is to be seen in the Tech Model Railway Club, which started in 1961 within the AI department uh, at MIT. It was an important student teaching sandbox in which they solved computing problems in the context of model trains. It's still active today. Also, uh, in the early 70s, that saw major collaborative energy between Bell Labs and University of California at Berkeley. This is a very storied part of computer history in general. The point here is just to observe the dynamic and fast-moving work on AT&T's code base share of Unix. It is another example of a tight-knit community learning quickly and experimenting with each other as catalysts. 1976 landmark. The question emerges, if this goes on, how will a programmer make a living? One significant articulation of this haunting question came in the form of a cease and desist letter from Bill Gates to the Homebrew Computer Club. This club was made up of folks who enjoyed playing around on the Altair microcomputer using Microsoft's basic programming language. The quintessential complaint in the letter is thus. We have spent $40,000 in computer time creating this language. Quote, most directly, the thing you do is theft, unquote. The fundamental question is posed. How can a skilled programmer make a living when this stuff just gets stolen? How indeed? In retrospect, it's really easy to be like, oh, you meanie Bill Gates. But his line of reasoning was actually perfectly rational given most business assumptions at the time and he was certainly not the only one that held those concerns. 1978 landmark, an important public release by the hackers. 
This comes in the context of the Berkeley software distribution, usually referred to as BSD. In 1974, Robert Fabry and some graduate students got a Unix 4 installation running at Berkeley. By 1975, 40 US institutions were running this installation, and a huge partnering energy was developing, mostly over the phone and then soon over ARPANET. Academic centers in other countries were involved too, including Japan and Australia. There is now widespread interest in making Unix work for these institutions. <clears throat> also in 1975, Ken Thompson, the original author of Unix, came from Bell Labs to Berkeley on sabbatical, as did students Bill Joy and Chuck Haley. In, 19, in 1978, BSD-1 was released. The distribution contained utilities, notably Pascal and the predecessor to VI, and kernel enhancements to AT&T's Unix 6. BSD will go on to have an idyllic childhood, a painful adolescence, and ultimately evolve into a perfectly upstanding open source software citizen.